Well, what date we, were you picked up? Do you remember? I have no idea. Towards the end of 1944, whether it was October, November, I don't know. It was going towards winter. And I know that Nana and Charles van den Boren, those beautiful people at Marianne, did suggest to my mother that they would keep me and that they would not to move in at that stage. We were heading for winter. How was it going to be? They were prepared to keep me. Um, let her stay here for those few months. My mother and I suppose my father in the background were both so keen to start off a new, uh, to, to, to bring the family together again, the little family, the little nuclear family that, that, that we were, that she did come to get me and we moved into this little apartment. But the situation was just tragic because they were discovering slowly what had happened to their families. So both of them had a mother before the war, living still. The fathers had died young. In Warsaw. In Warsaw. And I thought that both those mothers had been taken to Treblinka, discovered very recently that one of the two mothers, my father's mother, had died very close very much towards the beginning, right at the beginning, she might have still had a normal burial. So she did not get to Treblinka. The other grandmother of mine was taken to Treblinka. My father's siblings with children were taken to Treblinka. My mother's siblings and their children were taken to Treblinka. They realized they had well, no family left. Whoever had been in Warsaw had been deported to Treblinka and had died. My father, it was, a, it was a tragic time. I didn't understand. I was still only, I was still only, wasn't quite, uh, I wasn't quite six. And I still didn't quite get it, but I got that they were very sad was a very, very sad time. And then I remember the 8th of May, 1945, which was the official liberation date. And I remember walking through the streets of Brussels with absolute, it was, it was absolute madness. People were celebrating, were, were hanging from the windows, uh, flags, there was so much relief. And, but of course for Jews, it was tragedy. It was just dark and my parents felt it. In this post-World War II trauma, traumatic period, my father discovered that a sister had survived in the Soviet Union and a brother had survived in Shanghai. But that was quite a, quite a bit later because there was this great, it was later that they, uh, when they discovered it, there was this great rush to see who maybe had survived somewhere. So there was a search. Every organisation, including the Bund, the Red Cross, they had lists and lists of people who had survived. They found people everywhere who had survived and people would look on those lists and search for a possible relative. And so some time later, my father discovered that um, my mother found that there she had no one left. And mum, please tell when you get to it, how this, the Israel connection of your mother's brothers. So my mother- But so before you do, perhaps just explain how you ended up in Australia. So, all this was happening in 1945, 46. People were coming who had been in Eastern Europe. Um, and I remember cases, someone had slept overnight. I woke up in the morning to find a strange hat and a cane in the, um, um, 
in my in the little front entrance to to our house. This was the second place we were living, and I didn't know who it was. It turned out to be a famous Yiddish poet, and he had come out of Eastern Europe, and he was t t telling the stories. I remember a lot. Had of he been? Coming. Had he been in a concentration camp? No, he had not. I think he might have been in the Soviet Union. But there were people coming back, and there were people talking, and there were people telling stories. And my parents were absorbed in these stories, finding out what had happened in the world they had known and the world they had grown up in and the world that had been destroyed. So it was a very difficult time for them. And I don't think they had the room in their, in their minds to worry about little children being worried about by this or not. We had survived. And before we knew it, I was back in school and I was going to a Yiddish school as well. And life sort of started being a bit more normal. Nevertheless, my father then found, as I said, my father found a sister who had survived, was repatriated with her husband to Poland. He found a brother who had survived in Shanghai with his young wife and they had had uh, they had gone east. They had gone east from Warsaw and had managed to get a visa via Japan um, to, to, to Shanghai and uh, that was uh, granted by this famous consul, the Japanese consul in, uh, in Kovno, uh, Chiune Sugihara, a well-known well -known name. And they had ended up in, in Shanghai. So when that happened, and my uncle in Shanghai was trying to organize the next step. They, well, he wasn't gonna stay in Shanghai. So where would he go? They wanted to go to the States. Impossible to get in for Polish citizens with Polish passport. The quota was very long. So he, his papers came through to go to Australia. And my parents decided to join him. We waited for the aunt and uncle to come from Poland. We wanted to make up what was left of the family to make up a little family again. So we waited for the family to come from uh, Poland, the, the couple, and uh, first uncle I had ever known, first aunt, and I adored them. And together we came by boat in 1949, helped by um, I don't remember whether it was the highest or the joint, helped us with the fares. The Americans were extremely helpful with, uh, financially to support us. And we came to Australia where we were greeted by our, by my father's younger brother, who was here already, and his wife and his gorgeous little daughter. And this is when we made up a family again and we started our lives in 1949. And then the story of your mother finding anyone surviving? Well, my mother thought she had no one left. Uh, she didn't find anyone. She knew that she had two brothers that had gone to Palestine, Israel in the 1930s. So she tried to look for them in, in, in Israel. Someone told her that they, had, that they knew them and they had gone back to Europe before the war. So my mother figured that what had happened to all the other Jews had happened to them and so that she had no one left. There were two younger brothers. And then in 1966, she was on a visit. To I had Israel. already spent over a year in Israel, in Tel Aviv. But she came and by that time I was married and my husband's sister lived in Tel Aviv. My parents stayed with her in the heart of Tel Aviv and in 1966 just before they were to return to, um, to, to Melbourne they went to um, a house in Kalisha Street which sort of belonged to the Bund and uh, there were gatherings there of Jews and uh, she hadn't wanted to go because she had a bad leg but my sister-in-law talked her into it and as she's walking up the steps there's a woman at the top that she recognised and recognised her from Warsaw, if you don't mind. And she said to her, oh, 
Rivkale, what are you doing here? My mother's name was Rivka, uh, known as Rivkale. And uh, before my mother managed to answer, the woman said, oh, but you have a brother here. You've got two brothers here. And so my mother discovered that those two brothers had not gone back to Europe. They were in the heart of Tel Aviv living. They were both grandfathers by then. And so the emotional reunion took place of her between her and her two brothers. But she couldn't stay. She had to go back. She was booked to go back and the business was waiting for them. They had to go back to Melbourne. They promised to come back and in 1968 they came again spent a lot of time, and from then on, we kept up a relationship. Every time I was in Israel, I saw my uncles and aunts uh, who had survived, and cousins, of course. And, uh, and that's the story of how she found two brothers. Is there anything else you would want to, uh, as an overall comment well, on your well, life, their lives, the way it panned out? What my overall went comment in the end, of course, is, and I never thought about the trauma that a four-year-old would go through being left, that that was not ever my focus. But my focus was on the people that saved me, that they took in a Jewish child, that they had the courage to do it, that they looked after me like one of their own, and I have retained a relationship in fact, I did not see them for many, many, many years. I was not in touch. I was a little girl when I left Belgium. We went to say goodbye to them. I was all of 10 at the time. We went to say goodbye to the family and I had no more contact with them at all. But then in the 19, late 1990s, I was in Washington. I was on my way to Belgium where my daughter, by complete coincidence, was living she had met a, a young man who was Belgian born and they had married and she was at that stage expecting her first child and I was coming to visit them and I went via the States and I went to Washington and in Washington I saw these lists of righteous Gentiles and the list under Belgium was a very proportionately to the population both of Belgium and the Jewish population in Belgium before the war was a very long list. And I looked at that list, but the names of the people that had saved me, of course, were not there because I hadn't done anything about it. So I was determined to find the grandchildren and whoever else was alive of that family. And it was late 1990s, maybe 1996, 97, and I went to Belgium and I told the story how I'd been in Washington and my husband was in Brussels and he said, he gave me the phone book to look up the phone number and to ring. Of course, I knew the surname and I rang a P. Cape, who I thought was Philip Cape, the boy, and it wasn't, a woman answered the phone and she turned out to be Patricia Cape, a younger sister who was born one of three children born to that couple, to Marianne and her American husband, Safford, born after the war. I did not know Patricia, but when I told her my story, she knew who I was. And she said, you're looking for my brother, Philippe. I said, yes, I am. And she put me in touch with the brother who was living in the country. I went and visited him. It was a most emotional reunion. He asked me for a photo of the family. I showed him the photo that every grandmother carries with her. I had by then four grandchildren and was expecting, there was one that had just been born mm -hmm. in uh, Belgium, or was going to be, yes, was just born. And I showed him the photo and this good looking, handsome, well built, he was a sailor, he loved boats. Man just broke into tears, he sobbed and sobbed. And uh, his comment was when he managed to get himself together, he said, when I see what's saving one life, one child, what that has produced, 
he said, I am very proud of what my grandparents and parents did. The photo was, of course, the photo of me and my husband, my three children and their partners and four grandchildren. And he was just, he was just so emotionally moved. And indeed, our tradition tells us that whoever saves one person saves a whole world. So when I left him, he said, we will never say goodbye again, never adieu. And unfortunately, he became very ill and died on an, and died during one of my following trips. But I also met, of course, with Miquette, the little girl who was my age. And we've remained friends to the present day. We're in touch. She always said, we will also never say goodbye, never say adieu to one another. And whenever I'm in Brussels, I spend a bit of time with her. And when I, um, she came to Australia, when she had a tragic turn in her life, and so we've kept up and I value what those people did because they gave me the most precious gift. They gave me life. And my mother and father had a very hard time making sure that their children survived, but we both did and they did. And that was a marvelous thing in itself.